Okay, I'm uh, the uh, the referee, I guess, for the last panel, the fiction writers panel, and therefore come forward. Joe Haldeman, David Brin, Larry Niven, Werner Vinci, and John Lomberg. Uh, and uh, I'll ask a question to you all while you're milling around and getting here, um, envisioning the Starship era. Um, if you have, say, you sit down to write a story, let's say of some complexity, maybe a novella even, um, and you try to envision how and therefore when we will develop a starship. I'd like you to cite the rough time period in which you think a starship might be built, you know, decade, century, 500 years, I don't know, and what this culture will be like that wants to do it and does do it, and what would be their goals. Okay? There's a whole story right there, and Hi, take hijack, notes. You two can write these the starship. stories. <laughs> They've been building it up in the air ever yeah. since 1980. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, do you want to start, Joe? Most of you don't even remember that. You yeah. should. Yeah, Jefferson I mean, Starship. But you're talking yeah. about a, a time frame. Yeah. I mean, what would you guess? Is it time oh, stamp? And, and what kind of society does it? Yeah, sure. The time frame depends on what sort of a... Uh, kind of humanity you have left when you have built this starship, it seems to me that the amount of time, energy, and social growth that you're talking about, if you want to wind up with something that's an actual practical starship, means you have to essentially redefine what life is like on Earth before it leaves, because it's just that big a problem. It's like saying, oh, I want to duplicate World War II, but I want it 10 times as big and what are we going to be like when it's, uh, when it's over? It's, uh, the, the, the magnitude of the problem itself is, uh, it seems to me, is going to change what uh, the definition of life is like. Okay. John? Uh, Freeman Dyson once said, the best reason for star travel is to get away from your government. And that's often been a motivation for people. I suspect the solar system will have to fill up considerably before it starts getting crowded. But... Uh, as long as there's the solar system to, to explore and so much to do, I don't think there'll be a strong desire to build, uh, certainly with starships with people in them. But when the solar system is, fills up, I think that's mm -hmm. a couple of centuries. Mm -hmm. Werner. Uh, in keeping with Peter Schwartz, I have two, two scenarios. Uh, one, one is that we, very much the scenarios that have been described at, at this meeting, where we, where we get a, a system-wide civilization building up over the next century, I doubt very much the political center of gravity would remain on Earth, which is something that's generally ignored when you're trying to sell it to Earthling organizations, uh, that will actually recapitulate much of the uh, uh, history of the uh, uh, settlements of the last two or three hundred years politically. So. Uh, a system-wide civilization uh, in, the, in the late 21st century, I think, would, would regard, as has been pointed out here, would regard an interstellar mission as uh, uh, about the same magnitude as, as our space uh, missions have been in the 20th century, and it would very likely start out uh, with, uh, in, in somewhat the similar way. The second scenario is, of course, the technological singularity, given the, the rise of superhuman intelligence in the relatively near future. If that's the hypothesis, then uh, I think uh, all of this will fall into place very quickly, but unfortunately we will not be more than uh, uh, shipboard uh, pets. <laughs> uh, I mean, we'd be chosen on our looks, I hope. He, he's, <laughs> he's, he, David? He's, he's so much fun at these singularity gatherings. Both of us, when we're invited there, they, they say, why did we invite them? Well, now we're all depressed. Uh, one of the things um, I think I'll point out, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson just won the Nebula Award for uh, 2312, the only, hot, the only hard SF novel that was up for the Nebula Award uh, this year, but he depicts a system-wide, solar system-wide civilization um, at, uh, 200 years from now, 300 years from now, and it's um, it spectacular, and they're starting to talk about interstellar travel, and so that, that reaches a threshold effect that, that Joe was talking about. 
But um, Stan has been watching this um, streaming because um, he's very much intimately involved in the Clark Center. And um, he asked me to pass on a message speaking up for the notion of joint endeavors reached by a consensus method that's known as politics. And even the horrid, horrid, horrid word government. If it's, a, if it's a fair and decent and eclectic and diverse civilization, I'm with you, Stan. There are still uses for government. There are still uses for consensus developed joint efforts. And I just wanted to say one thing that shifts around, along from that, and that is I want to um, pass on to Jill our best wishes for continuing to search our, our garden for baubles. <laughs> yeah. uh, Larry? Uh, Okay, there, there is a, there is a, I'm a writer of fiction. Uh, you have to take that into account. Uh, for most of my career, I've set stories in, a, in an era where th whatever I want is, is easy, that most of the problems have been solved. Uh, I write stories I write stories in which uh, history is chaotic. So known space, if you've been following that, bounces all over the place. There's no grand, grand theme. Uh, but as for, the, as for interstellar travel, I, I think Robinson, I think Kim Robinson is right. Uh, that's uh, about 300 years from now, when the solar system is fully occupied is when we, when we get to thinking about, the, about interstellar travel, seriously. Human interstellar travel, that is. Mm -hmm. uh, by then, we'll know all about our environment. Uh, that is our local environment, the local neighborhood uh, for, for a few hundred light years out will be known to us. The target, star, the target stars and planets will be known to us. Uh, the, the science fiction field will be using them as adventure stories. Well, in fairness, uh, Larry, you, I think, did the most comprehensive job in your known space universe of going systematically through all the um, methods of interstellar travel uh, in the order of primitiveness moving on towards advancedness until you get warp drive and all those things. But your earliest um, versions were uh, very much in, in keeping with, with the theme of this conference. The, uh, uh, the Bassard ramjets only happened after the yeah. deuterium powered and first, then the antimatter. First the slow boats. Yeah, that's right. And I thought uh, you, you're, you were explored them all in your fiction. Mm -hmm. um, so the, I asked for sort of rough dates. So several people are ending up talking about 300 years from now. Well, if I could, yeah, I didn't comment on that, so I'll just mention the bypass problem. And the bypass problem yeah. is that if you have a civilization, long before it fills the solar system, it's going to be spending some discretionary money on in interstellar travel. Because if we have a civilization that's worthy of filling the solar system, it's going to continue the weird notion of this civilization which is weird compared to all the other ones on this, on this planet, and that is diversity is good, adventure is good, fun is good, and when you reach the point where it's at that half a percent, that half of that penny, um, then they're going to be launching them in the full knowledge that you have the bypass problem. And the bypass problem is you're gonna launch a, a probe in 2100 toward Alpha Centauri in the full knowledge, Analog just accepted a story of mine about this, that 40 years later, it's going to be caught in the backwash of the next one, and that one is going to be caught in the backwash of the one after that, and the one after that, and the one after that. And in my story, what happens is the only one that actually makes it for various humorous reasons is the first one. <laughs> and it finds the wreckage of all the civilizations that have already been on that star that we had planted earlier. And it, yeah, and it, the tortoise finds racing through, not a, uh, unable to see very much, racing through, it spots, there was once a s technological civilization here. The, you're such a cockeyed um, optimist. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the tortoise wins, but the, the, do, do you, does anybody here subscribe to the, the, the Generation Starship belief that the, the people will forget they're in a starship? 
and so on. That's the, the famous Heinlein story, but there was an earlier one also, the same Ryan idea. Aldous. No, that was much Edmund later. Hamilton. No, the first such story was 1938. So, I mean, does anybody think there will be generation starships? I mean, many, many generations. It seems to me the generation starship really fits with what, for instance, uh, Freeman Dyson was talking about yesterday. It's not that much different from the uh, island hopping. Yeah, I think I, think I believe in the generation starships. Uh, I think they'll start as O'Neill colonies and grow more mobile. And, and, and Greg Benford and I wrote a novel, Heart of the Comet, in which uh, you shows the establishment of Oort cloud human civilization. And they think of the stars as being as homes of these things that go streaking past um, the huts. But eventually, they inherit the universe because the, they jump from one Oort cloud to the next, to the next, to the next. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, uh, I can't have been the only person to have written this story, but I wrote a trilogy, uh, Worlds, Worlds Apart, and Worlds Enough in Time, mm -hmm. which winds up with a big starship, but, uh, well, actually an O'Neill colony, and it starts to run down. Mm -hmm. And the last book, you know, this is not a very happy book, but all the systems are failing. People are walking around in their grandfather's clothing, uh, there's hardly enough food for people to, for the population to increase. And I think that's a scenario that could be defended. I mean, entropy has a lot of patience. <laughs> History has a lot of branches. Uh, entropy is always waiting, is that your point? <laughs> if our species is successful, that'll be, that'll be happening to somebody, and it'll be an object lesson to the rest of us. Yeah. Oh, oh, John, I wanted to introduce you to Peter Schwartz right there. He is exactly the guy who's going to build your next garden. Right under the clock of the long now out of Texas stone. It'll be different. It, you won't have to need as much water for it. <laughs> the cactuses will be the galactic clusters. Right. So, uh, Okay, for question time, you ready to face the music? So um, people haven't talked much about um, computational genetics, where we have computational control of genetics, and the consequence for um, substantial rewriting and constructing of both artifacts and people. The people may be a little bit. But w the, these starships sound quite static. And over many generations, surely they wouldn't be much like they started out to be. So the ship of Theseus is a case where all the boards have been changed while the ship is afloat. Wouldn't that happen? Anyone? Sure. Yeah? That's almost yeah, a given. The relevance of the initial? Oh. Well, you have to get started, even if you're having facing the bypass problem. Somebody has to start. And the bypass problem will be used as an excuse not to launch some missions. But eventually, somebody's going to go if only hell's angels. <laughs> Just, you're saying that you, you got to build these bi bypasses? <laughs> oh, the interstellar the, bypass. Of, it, the, the bypass <laughs> problem, if I've got you right, is, is that if you're the first to go to, to Alpha Centaurus, others will pass you on the way, set up a civilization, and, and greet you as a... Uh, as a wanderer, wandering nomad. Which was exactly the, the plot of Far Centaurus, an anti yeah. Van Boat story, which was one of the right. early expressions. Sure. Uh, uh, what about this possibility? Since you brought up Alice Centauri, it's sitting there, it looks like a really good chance, but Stephen Dole in the 1950s in his book, Habitable Plants for Man, assigned something like one third of the chance of the, that there's a habitable planet within, I've forgotten how many, 15 light years or something, to Alpha Centauri. And we now know that uh, from simulations that the, the habitable zone orbits are stable over long periods, like billions of years, and therefore the, the system is not apparently would not have disrupted itself. So suppose we get really lucky. We find evidence of a biosphere, maybe an ozone line, on one of the planets in the habitable zone. No sign of electromagnetic transmissions. No sign of any technology like leaking tritium or something. 
Uh, how do you think that would change our view of sending, let's say, on the cheap, a robotic probe to look at it? Suppose this happens a century from now, a starship century from now. <laughs> yeah, I think that would, uh, it, well, it depends on what civilization we have within, within the solar system, but it seems to me it would be a, a surefire way of uh, digging up funds somewhere to do something. And uh, even taking a very, a very conservative look at the next century, it seems to me that the, that the schemes that have been proposed here today would be good enough to do it quite reasonably. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else? Well, I think you should watch out in a couple of years, uh, about a year for The Three-Body Problem by Liu Cixin, who's by far the best science fiction author to come out ever in China. He's just translated by Ken Liu recently, a Nebula Award winner in his own right. I just read the manuscript and provided a blurb. And it's, it's partly about a three-body um, unstable star, which he chose to be a system that he chose to be Alpha Centauri. Uh, we now know that uh, don't throw brick bats because it is stable, yeah. whereas he's dealing with one that has intelligent life and is unstable and winds up in conflict with us. But I, I keep your eyes open for him because uh, China's waking mm -hmm. up and the one for sure find it, the sign of a civilization that's ready to do great things is whether or not science fiction is doing well. Yes. <laughs> here, here. Question? Uh, by your presence here, you are participating in this uh, uh, multi-generational project, and we, we have examples we've talked about before, uh, like the uh, building of cathedrals that have taken over a century. So uh, my question is, as purveyors of popular culture, are there examples in human history of these multi-generational projects, and how do we use them as examples that might uh, spur us on to this particular project. The Any, basics anyone? of science fiction, that, that's taken several centuries. Uh, call it a cathedral, it's, it's imaginary, you build it in your head, but here is a set of procedures for determining futures different from your own. Uh, it continues to be built. It's good. I think that Neil Stevenson had a, had a very excellent recent book, Anathem, in which he talks about uh, um, ma maintaining a, a technological focus over a number of centuries. Now, his, his main point is how to maintain a technological focus over a number of centuries on a planet-bound civilization that periodically does bad things to itself. But I, I think that uh, the, 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 the ideas actually are things that, uh, for me, would also be very evocative in the case where you had other sorts of long-range projects that you needed to handle. I think this is very relevant to a topic that was going to come up in, on this panel eventually, and that is the Fermi paradox, which is the ghost at the banquet. Mm -hmm. It lurks at these, at, 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 in all of this. It keeps coming up. Uh, I've charted 100, close to 100, um, uh, varied explanations, and I never understand why people leap to one and say this is it, because um, you know I've categorized them as being some more plausible than others. Um, but I mean, one optimistic one is that the one non-Copernican thing about our solar system is that its life world skates the very inner edge of the continuously habitable zone. That's why we have so much trouble with just a small amount of greenhouse gas. Um, and therefore, it may be that the average uh, life world out there with oceans uh, may have much more carbon dioxide, less oxygen, and much less land surface area, in which case we would find a universe teeming with life, uh, maybe intelligent life, but this would help to explain why they have been disadvantaged at hands and fire stuff like radio telescopes. But um, I, I I've always loved the notion of an, an ocean-bound uh, civilization, no, nothing but water. Uh, and what they've evolved for telescopes is pairs of jellyfish. <laughs> and, and, and this would give the people who are at both ends of the big debates over, over um, SETI um, both what they want, 
lots of voices to talk to, but nobody in a pre-established order telling us what to do. And we get to be the postmen, the, the so to speak, the cops, the, <laughs> the, 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 the elder race that teaches lessons. Um, it's the best of all possible of the hundred. But the, the, the point is that it, the more I think about it, the more I think that it, 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 it may be social. Because if you look at the natural attractor state for human civilization across the last 6,000 years, it's almost always when we got metal, metals and yeah. agriculture, we formed these pyramidal social structures in which large men connived with each other to pick up metal implements and take other men's women and wheat. <laughs> and if it sounds sexist, right. So the, the point is that this is a natural attractor state. It's where we tend to slump because it has Darwinian advantages to the conniving oligarchs. We're all descended from the harems of the guys who pulled this off, <laughs> which helps explain how males think, ladies. So, so what, it comes down, <laughs> what it comes down to is um, I believe that one of the top Fermis, which is what I call the explanations for the great silence, I think one of the top ones is cultural. And I think that the, this, in, this enlightenment, if it fails, the, um, the oligarchs who take over will do what the oligarchs did after the fall of the Athenian democracy and bend heaven and earth to make sure it isn't tried again for another 2,000 years. Hmm. And if you have such a society, I think that it is much less likely to hold meetings like this, which are bold, diverse, fun, and, 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 and libertarian, uh, to an extent that, it, that depresses even Kim Stanley Robinson. Uh, and I think, that, I think that this is the sort of society that may be very rare. Hmm. One John. of my favorite books is uh, Werner Vinge's A Deepness in the Sky. Hmm. And yeah, amazing book. But the society, the human society there, a, a kind of trading culture that spreads through the galaxy and has very long range planning of when they're going to have reunions and things, they're not bound to a planet. And I suspect that the people who build the starships and travel are going to be much more like that. It's not that they're people who lived on a planet who move into this starship and where's my room and where's the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. They're going to be people who already have many generations of experience of being uh, space gypsies. So it's not as much of a shock to how do we retool our society for a starship. That's who they are. Mm -hmm. And moving out between the stars, is that's just what they do. And I think that avoids a lot of the the problems of having to go from being a planetary society and those same people now have to be the crew of the starship. I don't think it's going to happen that way. John, that leads directly into my question, that there seems to be a tremendous amount of planetary chauvinism here. That, you know, wh what do we need in another solar system isn't Earth-like planets, it's a useful asteroid belt. Because if we're going to go by Freeman Dyson's island hopping, people are not just not using planets, they're using comets and concentrators to be able to live between the stars. So when you get to another star, why do you go away from where all the, the mass and energy are easy to get at and climb down into a gravity well? And it's the classic O'Neillian thing. You, you and, can't oh, surf and, and, on and an And a asteroid. comment for David Brin, of course we're <laughs> And I, I just wanted to get another a, a comment on what he said earlier. Of course we're skating the inner, inner edge of the habitable zone. And that, of course, explains why we spent most of the last few million years in an ice age. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of things you can't do in the asteroids, you know. I, I mean, the, you know, look at all the creature comforts here in La Jolla, you know. You're not going to get that on an asteroid. On the inside, I, I, you actually, can make something like it. I, 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 I disagree with you, Greg. I think, really? I think the asteroid belt actually uh, uh, is, is probably like uh, um, North America and Europe is to Mesopotamia in terms of you know, what's appropriate for different levels of technology. On the other hand, um, I, in fact, my ex-wife wrote a novel once called The Outcasts of Heaven Belt. Yeah. And the, the supposition of the story was that the conclusions that have just been expressed here became the general opinion of humanity. And a thousand years later, when there was some colonization going on, they found the perfect solar system for a civilization. It had had the most magnificent asteroid belt. 
Um, and it ignored the fact that civilizations fall. And in a, in a uh, uh, that wisdom about the asteroid belt ignores the fact that civilization falls. Probably what you want to have uh, in a, in a sublight type situation that we're talking about is planetary systems that have a good asteroid belt, but also have a place where people could survive even if they've had a very bad time um, with, uh, with technological disasters and can sort of have a, have a backup system in terms of a, a natural ecosphere. I have to say that those who claim that the existence of, of an ice age means that we're not at the inner edge are incredibly northern hemisphere Euro uh, chauvinists. <laughs> um, life was doing just fine all over the place before that, uh, during, during the ice ages. And the main thing is here that, uh, well, I think Freeman uh, uh, has made a tremendous contribution by discussing what we need, I mean, what life will do if you're going to have real panspermia, and then not just seeds that land in a, in a, in a fecund little ocean, uh, the wicker missing hoyle thing, but actually create the greenhouses and the concentrators to, to uh, green the cosmos in, in a more uh, organic sort of a way. And this is, I think, one thing we don't see in our asteroid belt, just as we don't see the wreckage, we don't see the ancient artifacts. Though in my latest novel, I talk about the corpses and the artifacts and sent between the stars and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and I think that the existence, which is that novel that you're talking about, um, is, is probably the most thorough example I've ever seen of the, of, of the, of the reasonably small artifact uh, type, uh, type scenario, which is, uh, I, I think, one of, the, one of the more likely versions of, of uh, uh, where we could get a face full of surprise in, in the next century or so within our solar system. Do you mean we stumble upon one such football-sized object? We start finding artifacts, especially if they can talk. Yeah, if, especially if they can talk. Well, Peter Schwartz can talk, and he has a question. <laughs> Good second. Oh, sorry. Oh, we've already got a question back there first. Okay. In 2004, the Book of Earth came out The mic's not working. I don't believe that. For, uh, I've never seen any rendition of the lunar hypothesis that made much sense to me. Though, again, everything's yeah. been done by Larry Niven. Yeah. <laughs> when I first started writing, that was a popular theory, and I used it throughout known space. The, the, planet, the, the planets turned weird beca whether, uh, because they had a big moon or because they didn't. Uh, and there were various uh, other things, like, for instance, on one planet, the, 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 there's a big mountain that rises above the, the dense atmosphere. Um, and, and, and the rest of it is Venus, stolen. I don't think it was quite Venus. Well, it, well, it was right. pretty much Venus. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. That, there's another question? Uh, <laughs> and where where do you teach? Oh yeah, right. Oh. So, I mean, it's not all of them, but there's a tiny, tiny group of questions. So, I mean, so the question is basically, this is a very positive group, but when I compare it to what I'm seeing at the coalface in the classroom, I feel depressed. So I'd like to know your reaction as science fiction authors to this, what seems to be going on. Uh, may I? I need some help here. There's a governor of, a, of, a, of one of the states, and I'm going to have to be reminded which, but he wants to make it mandatory to teach science fiction in colleges. Uh, actually, it's yeah. West Virginia, and it's a state senator. Yeah. I, I forget his name, but uh, he, and he's a yeah. Republican. And we're paying him off. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah what? what? Wait, you know, you know what I would tell the, the, those, those students? I would say, you know, if you don't read science fiction, uh, there's a very good chance you're going to end up working for the people who do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is Mr. Brown from the SETI League here? He mm -hmm. was going to attend this meeting. I wanted to point out one thing, that the Benford boys, and uh, the son of one of them, uh, came up with the Benford, Benford, Benford paper um, uh, la last year or the year before. You might look it up. And it uh, reanalyzed um, some of the calculations that Seth Shostak of the SETI Institute had made before that uh, about uh, detectability uh, and the whole SETI question. Um, of, uh, of how to go about this. And um, it turns out that one of the only backyard radio telescopes that, that is fully functional in, in the, what I consider to be a wonderful supplement to the SETI Institute's Allen Array, which, which looks narrowly but incredibly powerfully at various spots in the sky. Um, th this is a, a wonderful technique for doing terrific science, but unfortunately, what the Benford cubed paper showed us is that it's likely that if aliens are, tr they know about our star, they know about our, they know that Earth has an anomalous oxygen atmosphere with ozone. If it's within a thousand light years, remember they're more advanced than us, that they would not send out these you who cries into the cosmos because it's economically less efficient than taking a laser pointer and saying, anybody there this year? Anybody there this year? Anybody there this year? Anybody there this year? And that would fit the wow signal that I'm sure some of you have heard about from the 1970s. And the way you catch those and then alert Jill to swing everything quickly that way would be a supplementary or complementary system which is planned by the SETI League, but never got a billionaire behind it. And that is to get 5,000 backyard radio telescopes, lower power, mm -hmm. around the world, watching the whole sky all the time. Yeah. And that would, it, what? Independently, not as an well, yeah. No, not as an interferometer, right. But independently, but tied in to a, um, to a computational system that, that Jill would run. Uh, or somebody working for her, uh, and, and that, that it would instantly alert. And I think this is the thing that's missing from SETI, because I think that it's, it, the Benford boys have shown us that that's one of the strongest possible scenarios, mm. is the ping, ping, ping. And you don't find those by going, look, look, look. Yeah. Well, anyway, back to the questions. Did you have a question, Matt? Right. Yeah. Oh, it's Peter Schwartz. Oh, yeah. Uh, Getting yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and they'll be working for the SF writers, too. Uh, my, 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 my point is, uh, the question I really want to ask is one of the, the kind of models of our circumstances that we haven't touched on is a variation on Fred Coyle's The Black Cloud, uh, which is interstellar dust in our past, as it were, as our, uh, our solar system begins in, in a voyage around the galaxy and begins to encounter some very large dust cloud that effect, impacts our civilization. Does that play out in any of your theories of how this could play out? It's a great story. Yeah. Uh, I said it first. We, <laughs> if we run across dust, we deal with it. I don't think it affects our, our imaginary history very much. One way uh, you can integrate it if you like. Also, the, the speed back. of the sun moving through the galaxy is such mm -hmm. that it's not that on Wednesday the sky is clear and on Thursday you enter a dark cloud. That whole process will probably take tens of thousands of years, which is nothing in galactic terms. But I don't think that it would, it, it'll happen so slowly that, it, it, that civilization and the life forms on the planet will just adapt to it uh, by evolution. So it won't be a sudden, all of a sudden it's gotten dark. It, it is sobering to me that uh, thinking of larger, a larger range of different That's types painful. of disasters, that um, the last few decades have kind of r revealed and intensified the feeling that we, that we live in a universe that is a hierarchy of disasters. 
There are disasters at all scales, from going out here and getting hit by a car when you walk across the street to getting hit by, by much, much bigger things that are floating around. And uh, I think this, this should, um, on, the, on the time scale that you want a civilization to survive, this uh, definitely means that people who have meetings like this are, are not just uh, 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 star-dazzled uh, uh, dreamers. There really are reasons for wanting to have some sort of uh, grasp on larger disasters. Oh, this ties in with one of our big take-home lessons from this gathering that I think from the last two days, and that is we really need to know a lot more about the interstellar medium. I mean, that's really, really one of the big take-home lessons. Mm -hmm. And this question? Uh, both the question and a comment. I think it's wonderfully appropriate to have this conference, and particularly you all who are such wonderful purveyors and inspirers of imagination to launch the Clark Center for Human Imagination. But I do agree with the points that have been made. I think we have a real problem in that as people read and the younger generations read less and less and reading as opposed to multimedia and interactive media and uh, as we 3D media uh, printed uh, into everything imaginable except and maybe even our hearts, uh, that I would like to know any thoughts you have, and, and John, your garden is a, a wonderful example of how we're going to further engage the next generations to even want to build a starship unless it is because it is out of danger or protection or the dark side. Hmm. Any answers? How do, how do we uh, inspire people to be more realistic about their own futures? <laughs> yeah, civilization is saved by the bright ones. Uh, you, you're, you're never going to find a civilization that's saved by every living mind in it. Uh, all it takes is a few bright ones to keep it going. And we've got, we get more of those every, every year that, uh, that we, we exceed 7 billion people. Well, Arnold Toynbee expressed that, um, Larry, by saying that in studying history, as uh, no one no one knew the rise and fall of civilizations better than he did, he he, he found the one pattern was, and and you should read Jared Diamond's book Collapse, but it's tendentiously aimed at one kind of failure mode, and Toynbee was more general. He said that civilizations thrived and adapted to changing circumstances when they invested trust and resources in their creative minority. And right now, um, we have some of the propaganda from one end of the political spectrum and all of the propaganda from the other end of the political spectrum engaged in a relentless campaign against the creative minorities in our culture. Now, we still have habits from the old can-do era and, and, and we still have NASA, we still have a lot, we still have science fiction. But I've noticed that a lot of the propaganda from both left and right, more so on one side than the other, but it both, is uh, against scientists, teachers, professors, civil servants, medical doctors, any smarty pants, member of the smarty pants clades is the enemy. And I think, I think we need to think about who might be wanting that, and who might be the people left standing. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned them when I spoke about this. We have time for one more question. Yes, this one is a, is a sort of odd one. Uh, the aliens are presumably on a planet. It's rotating. It's orbiting. It's moving somewhere in the galaxy. It sends out a beam. We're doing the same thing. How can we ever get anything but a wow signal? Anyone? I mean, you, a good you, point. you take your transmitter off the planet and, and free it of that oscillation. Well, actually, Jim Benford and I and, and um, Seth Shostak, uh, who, who's on the other side of our, this debate, uh, there's going to be a substantial debate in the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society about the question of whether or not Earth, people on Earth should arrogate, that gives you a clue of my position, the authority to y shout yoo-hoo into the cosmos based upon unwarranted assumptions. Mm. 
No, it's a civil it's a civil argument among among guys who consider we consider ourselves to be peers and brothers who dream the same dream, but it's a substantial argument over whether or not it is wise when you are effectively toddlers mm -hmm. in a in a jungle that's too quiet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's uh, we're out of time. We're out of time with that nice remark. Um, thanks a lot. And and now a little bit of uh, housekeeping stuff. Uh, the bus to the La Jolla Shores Hotel begin, begins at 5:45 and ends at 6:15. And then we're going to do the farewell remarks, uh, and then the transport problem will be straightened out later. Uh, but and I'll, if any of you uh, have any special transport needs, um, come and see me up here as well. Yeah, and I'll disband make my last remark. Oh, disband the panel. Yeah, you may. You're free to go, <laughs> but but let us know where you are. <laughs> um, I'll just say briefly that this has been a lot of fun. Jim and I had a lot of fun putting it together. It was great working with Sheldon and the Clark people. And we look forward to future such events, uh, different kinds, but I hope just as engaging. Uh, somebody said to me that they thought this was the, the, the star, uh, Starship Woodstock. And uh, I thought the entertainment was better, actually, than that. Uh, so thanks for coming. OK. I have. <laughs> One final remark, if you will. I and Greg, Greg, Greg and I put this together because we thought if we got enough good people together, these people sitting up toward the front here, and they got to interact and in nonlinear fashion, and that the people who th think about this problem, care about this problem, and that's you up there, came as well, and that people could see it on the web that we would reach a critical mass. And I think that's happened. And you know what happens when you reach critical mass. <laughs> Things explode. So in conclusion, we hope that you understand that the goal of starships is at least as challenging as anything done before. We also hope that you will be energized to advance us toward meeting this challenge, perhaps by joining or in supporting some of the organizations that I have described. And I recall in the past a news announcer I heard who at the end of a news report said, if you don't like our news, go out and make some news of your own. <laughs> Okay, now it's my job to uh, close this and, uh, and, and as I do, of course, uh, thank uh, Greg and Jim Bemford for um, uh, coming to us with this idea for this symposium. And as I, as I opened this, uh, you know, my, my, my imagination about it is that it would be the uh, perfect capstone to our inauguration and, I, and, and, and it's proven to be that. It's a set of ideas that are, um, uh, you know, that, that Ar Sir Arthur would have been proud to have in his name. And, um, but, I, but I do want to also say, you know, this is, this is an aspect of the range of things that we're looking to do at the Clark Center. And um, I just want to bring, bring our website back up. And that we have, you know, stay tuned to this website in the, in the coming year. It, it'll actually be a very different looking website in about two weeks. We almost had it up before the event, but um, didn't quite get there. But the one, and, and I also want to have to, I have to leave on a plea of how to support us, you know. So again, this, uh, this conference, um, you know, was put together with a lot of, uh, a lot of scraping together the resources for it, and, uh, and I hope you all found it uh, uh, worth your while and uh, can see to uh, helping us continue to make these things happen in the future. So right now, book signing out front. Logistic problems, as Greg has uh, uh, laid out, will be, will be try to handle to get to the Mysterious Galaxy bookstore um, right up here. 
And uh, thank you all again. See you in see you in this see you in a century on another star. Maybe on a planet around a star.